All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice refreshment. I had some nice coffee, still enjoying it. Uh, thank you for this. Um, and I hope you're ready to join my session. Uh, failure is not an option. Uh, durable execution plus Dapper is a rocket emoji. Uh, yeah, what is the right translation for that? I think it, it's awesome. The combination of the two are awesome. Um, I think it's something that I should ask also like a chat GPT from here. Yeah, what is the right outcome of durable execution plus Dapper equals? So I will save that for uh, a next session. I, I really loved Scott's keynote, by the way. Uh, really cool. Um, so I'll be talking a lot about failure in the first couple of minutes, and I'm sure you're all quite familiar what failure is. Uh, you probably encounter it like on a weekly, maybe a daily basis when you need to solve uh, or figure out some bugs. Uh, well, yeah, that, that's the life of a software developer, right? Um, but I hope that in this session I will give you some tips how you can use like a, a big open source project Dapper uh, to actually uh, limit the risks of these uh, failures to, to actually minimize their impact. I think that's a better way of, um, of saying it. Um, I'll be standing out here because I'll do like some slides within VS Code uh, because I, I love VS Code and all its extensions. Uh, so I'll be mostly be standing here and, and doing a lot of a lot of demos. So as I mentioned, right, we are probably quite used to failure. We know that failure is inevitable, definitely in software. And maybe some of you have enough life experience uh, as I have to have seen this meshes out there in the wild in Windows XP, uh, task failed successfully, which is of course like a very weird thing to show to a user. I mean, it's even like an informational message. It's not even like an, a failure message. Um, yeah, so it's weird, but actually, yeah, this talk is about this, this message uh, because actually when a system fails, we want to fail it in a successful way. Uh, so uh, we don't want users to, uh, to have like a bad experience. Uh, so maybe something does fail, uh, but the user hopefully has like a very minimal impact of that failure. So uh, I think it's actually a very, very nice message, uh, just it shouldn't be there in, in the user's face. I also come, came across this, uh, this quote, unfortunately I did not find uh, the attribution, so I don't know where it's actually from, uh, but failure to plan is planning to fail, I think. Yeah, that's probably true for everything, but definitely in software, if you don't think about all of the edge cases and think about if you're building like a big distributed system, about all of the moving parts and all the things that can go wrong, well, of course it will go wrong at some day, uh, and then you don't know how to, how to act. So definitely plan ahead when you're uh, designing and building software. So for people who don't know me, I'm Mark Duiker. I'm a senior developer advocate at Diagrid. That is a company founded by the co-creators of Dapper Open Source, Mark Fossil and Jeroen Snyder. We've been working there for about a year and a half now. Um, and we're really a company that's really invested in, in open source. So a lot of our engineers are working uh, on Dapper like full time. It's really cool to see. I'm one of the Dapper community managers, and that means that every other week on a Wednesday we do a live stream, and then we invite some contributors and maintainers to talk about new features of, of Dapper. Uh, like in two weeks there will be a new version, version 1.14, and we also invite like Dapper end users to explain how they use Dapper in production. So that's also a very nice learnings from, uh, from that. Um, I consider myself a long-time developer supporter. Uh, well, what does it mean? Uh, I really want to help developers achieve their goals. So if you have set some kind of goal, either in your professional life or maybe in a, a developer community uh, environment, uh, I definitely want to help out there uh, if, you, if you can't figure it out yourself. So feel free to, uh, to send me an, a message uh, if you need some help there. Um, I have like many creative hobbies, like too many to mention here. I like pixel art, I like uh, making music with my modular synthesizer, I like creative coding. Um, if you're interested in any of these things, please have a look at my, uh, my website, uh, markdiker.dev. Um, and uh, let's move on to, um, to, to more failures, uh, because I've been looking into some failures, and, but there's actually a lot of it that can be found on, on the internet. And I found a really nice blog post, already quite old from 2015 on the IEEE Spectrum blog um, and named Lessons from a Decade of IT uh, Failures. So they looked at very big IT failures between 2005 and 2015 uh, and then tried to find some kind of patterns uh, in there. So what went wrong? Of course, there are like a gazillion different reasons why things go wrong. Uh, but one of the things that really was, I found really striking was like had the, 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 the cost involved in these IT failures. So if you look at this, uh, this, this legend here, we see that the biggest circle uh, is, is equal to like $10 billion in cost. And if you then look at this chart here, which uh, is now like uh, have each, each 
geographical region has now a line uh, on, on the time axis, we see yeah, a lot of big circles, even far, far greater than this 10, 10 billion. And so over this like 10 year time frame, uh, the, the total cost of IT failures definitely runs in like the hundreds of billions uh, and maybe even thousands of billions uh, of, of damages, which is yeah, it's, it's mind blowing. And just to give an indication how quickly something can go wrong and how big the impact is, I got this quote from this blog post. So the Knight Capital Group changed uh, an, an algorithm they used for their trading system, and within 45 minutes they lost 440 million dollars. So oof, I, I do not want to be the person who made the, who, who pushed the production uh, for that. I hope at the moment you can still do like a like a kind of a blameless post mortem. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but of course, uh, the, the things that I will share here today, it, it will not prevent you from, from uh, like probably major, major IT failures that will probably still happen, right? There's everywhere are still humans involved, uh, so also probably errors, but we should aim for uh, like, um, yeah, mitigating the risks or limiting the risks uh, when, when dealing with IT systems. So a lot of big organizations are building like these distributed systems, and that's not because they like to do it, but because their organization structure uh, forces them to do it like that, right? So if you're like a very big organization, uh, like thousands of people, uh, hundreds of software developers, many software development teams, and they all need to build to one system that can all like interact and communicate with each other, uh, then something like a microservice architecture makes sense. Uh, but it's definitely inherently difficult to, to make such a system work, right? So there's a lot of many, a lot of moving parts. I uh, have to make sure that everything is, is definitely reliable. So what do you do if a, a service is temporarily down because of a deployment or a network issue? Uh, how do you deal with security and observability? So, so these things are really hard. And um, we've been doing this distributed computing already for quite a while, and there's quite a bit of yeah, knowledge around that as well. Um, so this list, the fallacies of distributed computing, has also been out there since, since 1994. It, the list is compiled by Peter Deutsch and uh, James Gosling, and it uh, lists all kinds of fallacies, so statements which are not true, uh, but either people think they are true or they just put, don't put in enough time to actually figure out what it means uh, when you want to build distributed uh, systems. I'm not going to go through all of these uh, items here. This is not like a theoretical session. Uh, I will quickly move on to, to Dapper and some demos. Uh, but I definitely recommend you to uh, either uh, read the PDF uh, or um, have a look at this YouTube playlist. It's for, uh, by, uh, by Uri de Haan uh, from Particular Software. Uh, he gives really like a, a good trainings. Uh, and this video playlist is like a five minutes per, um, per these, these fallacies. So uh, highly recommended to look into that. So again, if you're building these kind of distributed applications, yeah, you run into some kind of issues, right? Because if you start small with just a couple of services, then it's probably okay. And maybe you, you create your own framework to, uh, to, to, to shave away some, some code and to reuse some code where you build the systems. Uh, but when it comes, yeah, becomes larger and larger and multiple teams get, get involved and maybe some different technology stacks get involved, yeah, then it becomes increasingly difficult to build these kind of things. Um, so luckily, yeah, there are some tools out there to help you build these kind of systems, and one of these tools, one of these projects, is Dapper Open Source. Yeah, so Dapper stands for Distributed Application Runtime. Uh, did anybody hear about Dapper before? Some hands. Anyone using it in production at the moment? I'm always very curious about that. I, I don't see a lot of hands, but if you are using it in production, definitely come see me uh, afterwards. I definitely have some, some questions and maybe something uh, that you can use. So Dapper provides all kinds of APIs or building blocks for uh, building secure and reliable microservices. Um, and it also covers a lot of cross-cutting concerns uh, when we deal with microservices. So what happens if you are developing and running uh, distributed applications with Dapper. Um, you have all of your services, but next to your services is uh, running, uh, Dapper is running in a separate process. Yeah? So Dapper is not part of your own application. Dapper is running in a separate process known as a sidecar next to your service. And that comes with a lot of benefits because a lot of responsibility that you would normally have to code yourself or use all kinds of packages uh, inside your own code base, you can now delegate to that Dapper sidecar. So uh, Dapper takes care of all of the communication uh, in your microservice architecture. So whenever you do like service-to-service uh, -service invocation between like uh, two services here, if you go from shopping cart to inventory, you don't make a direct call between shopping cart and inventory. No, your communication goes via the Dapper sidecar, and the Dapper sidecar uh, will then find out where this other service lives, and it will make a call through this other Dapper sidecar, which then forwards the call to the inventory service. And because all communication goes through this sidecar, uh, Dapper can really uh, um, 
track all of the communication that's going on, so it's ideal for observability. You also have one place where you can actually configure all of your security, so okay, which uh, services are allowed to talk to which other services, um, but also resiliency is also part of that. So just to do a bit of, of, of level set to everyone so everyone understands what Dapper is and what it can do, um, you can use Dapper with any language because Dapper runs in a sidecar next to your application, so it really doesn't matter what kind of language you use for your own applications. Um, and as I mentioned, Dapper comes with many uh, built-in APIs, many different um, building blocks. I will, uh, we will go into this workflow one uh, in the second part of this session. And in the first part, I'll focus a bit on service certification, state management, um, and also uh, resiliency, yeah, because these are the three cross-cutting concerns that Dapper offers, and so we'll be looking into resiliency a bit. Dapper is typically run on top of Kubernetes, so which yeah, means that you can run uh, Dapper basically anywhere where you have some kind of uh, form of Kubernetes. Uh, but there are some specialized services, for instance, Azure Container Apps is compatible with Dapper, uh, and also one of Diagrid products called uh, Diagrid Catalyst is also compatible with Dapper. Uh, but I'm running locally, yeah? so if, you, if you're developing Dapper applications, uh, you have the Dapper CLI, so you can also run Dapper locally. Another cool thing about Dapper is, uh, is the components, yeah? because the APIs are an abstraction of the underlying infrastructure. So here we see all of the different APIs, but for instance, if we look at um, the uh, Publish Subscribe API, yeah? so you can use the Dapper PubSub API in your application, um, but the, that doesn't, Dapper doesn't dictate which kind of underlying uh, PubSub system, messaging system you're using. So you can configure that via a YAML file, we'll look at that later, uh, but you can use it to configure Azure Service Bus when you're running in production, but maybe locally you're using something like a Redis container or a RabbitMQ. And uh, the only thing that you need to change is one of these component files, um, and your application source code stays the same, so that's, that's really powerful. So just to illustrate that, uh, when you're like, um, doing Dapper development locally, uh, for instance, with these three services, um, you can use the secrets API and point to a local file that contains your secrets. Of course, make sure that you don't check it into your Git repo. Um, you can use a uh, local running Redis container uh, when you do pub-sub messaging, because th that Redis container gets installed when you install Dapper. Uh, and you can use a, an in-memory state store when you use the state management API. And so this is nice for like a smooth um, inner loop development. Yeah, but then when you uh, move to production yeah, or like a, a test environment uh, running in Azure, then you can very quickly change out uh, all of these YAML files with another set. And you then point to Azure Key Vault for your storage, Azure Service Bus for, for pub-sub messaging, uh, and Cosmos DB for, for your state store. And all of the application code stays the same, yeah? because in your application code, you only refer to the Dapper API, uh, and not all of these specific APIs. Okay, let's, let's move on to, uh, to resiliency. So Dapper comes like with built-in resiliency policies. Yeah? So there are lots of default settings that Dapper uses, um, and that's ideal for when you do like um, service-to-service certification, such as this example, um, but it also applies to other uh, examples when you want to communicate with a state store or to a message broker. Uh, they all have their default uh, resiliency policies. So, again, I showed this in the, in the other chart earlier, but when your application is communicating, uh, when you do want to make a service call from application A to application B, you're not making a call directly. What you're doing in application A is you will call uh, the Dapper sidecar, and the Dapper sidecar will then figure out where the other application is living. Um, it will then forward the request to that other, other Dapper sidecar, and that will forward your request to the actual application, and then you get the response back. And the nice thing is that, that, that this Dapper sidecar, the Dapper runtime, will take care of um, retrying this call if application B is not running. Okay, so now it's time for a demo. So, and by the way, um, I'm doing this all in VS Code. I'm using a, an extension called Code Tour. So, uh, this is a very nice extension if you want to do some kind of a guided tour through your code base. So, I've, I really like it for like presentations such as this, but it's also ideal for like onboarding new people to your code base. Okay, so I'm, um, I'm moving into the resiliency, resiliency demo folder, and the demo is like two services, application A and application B. Um, we are using a REST client to make a call to application A, and that will make a service invocation call to application B, and application B will then store a record in a... Um, a uh, local Redis store, a key value store. So just to show you um, what, what we're dealing with here, so we have like two .NET applications, two web applications, here we're targeting .NET 8, and the only dependency we have is uh, Dapper ASP.NET Core. 
So if you look at the program CS file here, uh, we see a couple of things. So first we add the Depper client to our services collection. Uh, this is actually even not required for service to service invocation, um, but this is, all, is used for the pop sub example that's also in this um, uh, demo. Um, we then um, register the, the HTTP client. So whenever we want to uh, create, have an instance of the HTTP client, we are using the Depper client to create us a um, yeah, specific version of this HTTP client that, where a special header is set. Uh, because when you do service-to-service -service invocation, you always do a service invocation to a uh, application ID, to, to a target application ID. So every service that's running Dapper has a unique application ID. So um, by specifying this, we create an HTTP client which has an um, application ID set to application B. Uh, so all of the interactions that we do with this HTTP client object will be targeted to uh, application B. So the service invocation endpoint is the one that we're going to call with our uh, REST client. We provided the payload of social profile details, just some name and, and some GitHub handle and a Twitter handle. Uh, the HTTP client gets injected uh, and we're using the HTTP client to do a post to the slash profile endpoint and that's an endpoint living on our target B application. Uh, and once we get the response back, we do a console write line and we uh, return a, a 201 created. All right. Let's move to application B. Uh, again, a web application using .NET 8, uh, same dependency. And here the program CS is mostly the same regarding the, the setup. Um, what we see here is we have defined a state store component name. And so this application will take care of actually storing a bit of state in the key value store. Um, but Dapper needs an identifier to know how, which state store are we using. Uh, so this is the name of the state store and I will show you uh, quickly um, what the underlying state store is. So this is the endpoint that's being called by our application A, and the Depper, the Depper client will be injected uh, here. And we use the Depper API here, save state async, uh, to store this state in, this, in the state store. So we're specifying the name of the components that we're using, and since it's a key value pair based, we're specifying the key here, and this is the ID of the profile details, and then we store this as a JSON object there. All right, so how does Depper know what kind of state store is used? Well, that is configured uh, on, in a component file. Um, so that is, so there's this state store YAML file here. Uh, so this is a component file we see here, and here see, we see the same uh, label as we saw earlier in, um, in our source code. Yeah, so in the source code, we use the component name my state store, and this component file has the same label, so that is how Depper actually matches these things up, um, because in this component file, we specify a type of state.redis, and that's how Dapper then resolves this into an actual uh, Redis client. Usually there's some specific metadata uh, that is um, yeah, specific for these types of uh, state stores. All right. Um, I'm going to run this example first like in a happy path, and I'm going to use the um, Depper CLI for that, and Depper CLI is a feature called uh, multi-app run, and if you use multi-app run, you can run multiple applications in one go, which is, which is quite nice, and you do that by uh, pointing it to a, um, a YAML file again, which configures uh, what all the applications that we're running. So this is the this uh, Depper.yaml file. So we point to a, a resources folder, the resources path, and that contains the definition of our state store. Uh, so Depper can actually link up uh, which kind of state store we're using. And then there's a list of what kind of applications we're using. Yeah, so we have every Depper application needs an ID, so that's what we're configuring here. Um, it needs the folder or, uh, where our short code is because it needs to uh, run that. Uh, we set some application ports. And uh, optionally, you can also specify where your application logs and Depper logs are going to. Okay, so I'm going to run this now. Uh, so both applications are now like building and running. Uh, it's very verbose now because I'm logging both application logs and the Dapper logs uh, here to the console. So it's, it's very uh, verbose, but it's useful for, for the demo when we do the not so happy path. Um, so both applications are now up and running. And, and now let me make this a bit smaller. Here we go. Right. Um, so now I'll invoke application A. And um, I'm using another extension called uh, the REST client in VS Code. Um, and with that REST client, you can create these .htp files or .rest files, and then you create your, um, yeah, you can write your, uh, your invocations uh, like this. You can do a post or a get, and then specify the URL, and you can even use like variables, uh, like, like I've done here. Uh, and so in this case, I'm doing an, um, an post to uh, the application A using uh, to the service invocation endpoint, and I'm giving it a, a JSON payload of, uh, of this. 
Uh, this means I'm creating a new GUID every time I make a request. Uh, so let's do this. There's a link here, which is sort of a button, send request. And when I click this on the right hand side, the response will appear. So I'm doing that now. Okay, and I get back a 201 created, and this is the uh, ID of the record uh, that's now in the state store. And I can actually uh, check the state store here because this is like a viewer for uh, uh, for Redis. So if I expand this, yeah, so this is this is my uh, my state here. So this is the uh, uh, this is the value. Okay, so this is it works, but this is the happy path, right? We're not dealing with any any resiliency yet. Um, so let's so let's make it a bit more more difficult. Um, I'm actually stopping uh, the process now, so nothing is running at the moment. So now let's simulate there's a problem with application B. Yeah? So application A is up and running, but application B isn't. So now let's make the same call um, and see what's happening, uh, and then wait a few seconds, and then um, maybe we start application B. So I'm first going to move to the uh, move to the application A folder, uh, because now I'm not using the Debra multi app run, because I'm now uh, separately starting these services. So I'm first starting application A, so that's happening. And now I need to move in, oh, into the application B. And uh, I will copy the command how to run application B, but I'm not pressing enter just yet. So this is just there so I can quickly, st quickly start it, uh, but I'm not running it just yet. So now I will make the same request as, uh, as before. Yeah, to the uh, service verification endpoint by giving it this, this payload. And um, yeah, let's, let's, let's just see what, uh, what happens. We don't see the result yet, right? So the request is not, not completed yet. And we here see now uh, in the logs an error processing operation uh, uh, endpoint. Uh, and we will also see here retrying in two seconds, right? So we, we see that the Debra sidecar is actually uh, using the, this, this resiliency policy to retry um, had this, this call a couple of times. Now we're starting application B, and now we see our uh, response is successful. It took a long time, right? Like, 22 seconds, which is like very long. Uh, but you can see that the, that the resilient resiliency policy actually works. We all, what we also see in the logs here that uh, the Debra sidecar reports back that it actually has recovered, and it recovered after 12 attempts. All right, uh, let's stop these processes. Uh, close this one. All right, so uh, how did Depper do this? Well, Depper comes like with built-in resiliency policies, right? So uh, I didn't even have to set this up myself, uh, although the standard default retry policy for service verification is it does like three retries and it uh, waits a second before it does another one. Uh, in this case, I wanted a bit of a longer retry because I needed some time to uh, start and stop applications. Um, but you can actually override the default behavior um, by adding yet another configuration file. So we're now looking at the resiliency YAML file here. Um, and this is of a type of resiliency. Uh, again, you specify a name here. You don't have to um, uh, refer to this name in your application code. But whenever you start your application and the Debra process loads, it will also load in uh, this um, uh, resiliency policy that you create. Now, there are different ways to, to override the default behavior when it comes to resiliency policies. So there are a lot of, um, like I said, default resiliency policies, and you can actually um, override them by using the exact same name of that default retry uh, policy. So this is a very long name, but it's the default state store component outbound retry policy. Uh, so if you specify this exact name, you override the behavior of that specific policy. So that's one way you can do it, um, but uh, I think this is yeah, very verbose and you have to look up what the exact name is of that default policy. Uh, an easier way is to just create your own name for a retry policy uh, and then you can um, decide, okay, is this like a constant retry? So am I using like equal intervals between all of the retries? Uh, in this case, I'm waiting like two seconds every time. Uh, max retries minus one means I'm going to retry indefinitely, uh, which is not always a good case. Um, or you could do a retry with exponential backoff, and then you uh, define some, some other parameters. You specify, okay, what's the maximum interval that I want to have? Uh, and then uh, also you can do like max retries minus one or max retries uh, like, like 10. Um, another thing that you specify here are, are like circuit breakers. So sometimes just keep on retrying and retrying is not very useful because your backend may be down, and as soon as it's maybe like starting up, maybe you're firing too many. Um, uh, uh, unhandled requests, so maybe you're actually uh, killing your, your backend service before it actually uh, is 
back up live again. Uh, so in that case, it's a good idea to introduce a circuit breaker. Yeah? So normally uh, the circuit is, is closed, so a request can pass through, uh, but the circuit breaker will actually um, uh, yeah, open up the loop, so no request can, can go on. Uh, and that way you give your backends a bit of breathing room uh, because you don't allow any request to go, uh, to go through. So also here you have uh, quite some options uh, to, to specify uh, how many uh, failures need to be done before I actually open this circuit breaker, um, how long does it stay open, and how many requests will I actually uh, do before I check what the state is. Um, so that's the uh, policy part. Then there is like a targets part because you can uh, apply these policies to different targets. You can either apply them to uh, individual services, as I'm doing here. I have applied this my we try constant policy to uh, application B, but you can also apply these uh, um, policies to uh, components, and then uh, you specify the component name. So there's actually quite quite a lot of different ways, uh, quite some flexible ways, how to override all of the um, the retry policies with with Dapper. Okay, um, like I mentioned, there's also other types of resiliencies, um, for instance, specific for, for outbound things. So outbound means I'm going from the Depper sidecar to another component. And so in case my state store is, uh, has a network error or the state store is not available, Depper can also retry there. Uh, I, will, I will not not demo this because I want to move on to uh, some other stuff. Um, the same is true for, uh, for uh, inbound and outbound. Uh, let me see, where is this? Uh, no. Yeah, that's this one. So when it comes to pub sub messaging, uh, then you first have a sidecar that tries to deliver a message to the message broker. Uh, so that's an outbound resiliency policy that you can apply there in case the message broker is not uh, alive. Uh, but you can also configure an inbound policy. So that's when the Dapper sidecar has received a message from a topic, but it can't deliver it to your application uh, because your application might not be healthy for a moment. So you can definitely do uh, yeah, a lot of mixing and matching there. Um, the final thing I want to show you about uh, resiliency policies is uh, checking the, the production readiness when it comes to uh, 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 Depper applications. So uh, we have a, a free tool called uh, Conductor Free. Uh, and uh, what Conductor Free does, you install an agent on your Kubernetes cluster that could also be like a local running cluster, like a Minikube or, or a kind. Uh, and it will scan all of your uh, Depper configuration and all of these YAML files. And it will then give you like advice on what you can improve to make sure that the application is production ready. So it does it on three levels, so I have three pillars, there's security, reliability, and observability. Um, so uh, if you filter here on um, observe in, uh, for resiliency, for instance, it gives us like two recommendations. The first one is, okay, hey, well, there's a new Dapper version available. Uh, usually quite some things are like patched and solved in a new Dapper version, so that, that's a useful thing. Um, and another one, which is a, a minor one, that application health checks should be enabled. Uh, so you should actually add some annotations to your, um, uh, to your, to your cluster to make sure that Debern uh, understands or knows if your application is healthy. So this gives you uh, yeah, quite some good advice, uh, which I definitely recommend before going to production with your, uh, with your Debern applications. Okay, moving on to uh, the second part. So Drupal execution. Yeah, so again, just a refresher, what are we solving here? We know that all systems fail and that we need to recover. Uh, and ideally, we should recover uh, from, from failure in an automated way, right? We, we, don't, uh, we don't want to be called in the middle of the night uh, to restart a server or anything. Uh, ideally, recovery needs to be like automatic. So that's where uh, Drupal execution comes in. So what is Drupal execution? Well, it's like a running code in a stateful way. So in case the process that runs the code, in case that crashes, uh, then uh, a new process can start or the process can be restarted and the code uh, it will continue with execution to completion uh, without any loss of state. So uh, that, that, that sounds pretty cool and it is pretty cool. Um, uh, the Drupal execution term is probably a bit newish, um, but it's actually been around for quite a while, and, but under a different name, like workflow engines. Uh, so Drupal execution usually implies like uh, there's some workflow engine uh, under the hood. And well, for the people who don't know what that is, a workflow engine executes a set of activities or tasks in a specific sequence uh, that, that uh, someone like a developer or a business person defines. Um, and the whole workflow state is being persisted to a state store. And so in case that workflow uh, crashes or in case that process that wants the workflow crashes, um, that state can be, then be rehydrated and the process can continue. 
So I, I made a, an animation about, uh, about this to, to illustrate it. So on the left is the, uh, the, the workflow with three activities, and on the right is an append-only state store. And all of the lines that I'm drawing here uh, indicate when is some state from the workflow persisted to the state store, um, and when is some state being read back from that state store. So whenever the workflow encounters an activity that has not been executed yet, um, that input for the activity will be appended to the state store, then the activity does its work, because inside an activity you usually make a, like a service invocation call, or you make a call to a database, and when that activity is done, then also the output of that activity is stored in the database. Um, what happens when an activity is completed, then the workflow replays from the top. And so the workflow will never go immediately from activity one, two, and three. No, what happens is uh, the workflow starts, it does activity one, Activity one is finished, the workflow replays, and the workflow sees, okay, have I done activity one? Yes, read the results from the database, then continue with activity two. Have I done activity two? No, okay, let's schedule that work, and so on. So uh, there's a lot of communication going on that usually happens uh, with uh, queues, with the queue system. Um, so there's a lot of uh, checkpointing of, uh, of data. Now, a relatively new thing of workflows or workflow engines is uh, the workflow, uh, workflow as code types. So um, yeah, these, these are gaining quite a bit in, in popularity. Um, I really like them as well. Um, and workflow as code means that the workflow is actually written not by uh, someone in business who, who drags some boxes, um, but by a developer who actually writes um, these workflows in code. Um, and the reasons I really like them is well, yeah, they are part of the source code, yeah, so they're also in your Git repo, and hopefully you have some kind of a uh, PR review. So yeah, there's like the four I principle uh, when you uh, define and write this workflow before it gets merged into main. You can also unit test your workflows, which uh, which uh, be before before workflows code it was like really really difficult. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of workflows code. So there's a lot of tool, uh, tools out there. Uh, Temporal is quite well known. Uh, Restate, um, Azure Durable Functions. I've used that a lot uh, myself. And since uh, I think about um, less than a year, there's now Dapper Workflow. Uh, it's currently in, in beta. Um, I think in the early next year, it will be um, like, um, like fully uh, generally available. Um, I had this. Workflow as code is amazing, but there are still some challenges when it comes to workflow as code. So there's lots of things that you definitely need to think about. Um, and one of the things is um, that workflows need to be deterministic. Yeah? So workflows always need to give the same output when you give them the same input. Um, and that means that all of the non-deterministic code should not be in a workflow, but that should be part of an activity that the workflow is, is calling. Um, that also means that in your workflow code, you should not use uh, any random data, for instance, like good, new, good. Uh, don't do that inside your workflow and use it as a parameter to call an activity, for instance, or uh, date time uh, now. Also, do not do that in your workflow code. Uh, and most workflow systems have some, um, some special methods uh, to still um, uh, generate that, uh, that data and still generate goods and date times, uh, but don't use the uh, built-in .NET types in your workflow. Um, another thing is the uh, um, idempotency of your, of your workflow, right? So um, all of these workflow systems are based on queues, and uh, they usually have like the guarantee of uh, at least once delivery, uh, which means an activity will be called at least once, but maybe it's being, being called twice. And so what if you do like an insert statement in your activity into a database? Um, that activity may be called another time with the same values. So what happens if you do an insert twice in your database? But what, what kind of effect uh, does it have? So maybe you need to do like a read first before you do a write, or maybe you, do, you need to do something like an upsert. So I think about the, the effects that, um, and that, that it has when you call activities multiple times within a workflow. Um, another tricky thing is, and that's not, not dedicated to workflows as code, but it's workflow versioning. Um, so, for instance, when you introduce like a breaking change in your workflow, uh, for instance, you have like a sequence of multiple steps, and um, you decide, okay, I don't like this sequence of steps, I want to reorder some of these activities, so I have like a slightly different sequence. Um, so when you push that to production, uh, but maybe some workflows are like still in progress, so there's still some old state in that state store, but now you have a new version of the workflow running, that old state doesn't match the new workflow anymore, right? So when it 
the workflow engine tries to read some state, that state is now incompatible with your new workflow. So that, that's a very tricky thing to, to handle. Another thing to take into account is um, the payloads, uh, because as you saw, a lot of uh, things are being stored to the state store, but also being read from the state store, so there's a lot of I.O. Uh, so there are, yeah, also a lot of serialization is going on, so if you have very large payloads, uh, that means your performance will be, will be degrading. Okay, just to give you a couple of uh, samples of what you can do with, with Debra workflow, uh, there's a, some, some, um, some patterns, some common patterns that people use with, uh, when using workflows. One of them, the basic one, is this task chaining. So then the order of the activities is important. So we first need to do A, then B, and then C. And that's probably because the output of A is used as an input for B. Another one is uh, fan out, fan in. So here the order is completely irrelevant. So there's no dependency between the activities. You just uh, want to execute them as much as possible, like in a, in a batch kind of way. The nice thing is that you can aggregate over the results uh, in the workflow. So you first do like a fan out. I want to call all of the activities. But then in your workflow, you wait until all of these have been completed and then do some aggregation on the result. Uh, the monitor pattern is very useful if you want to do some kind of a recurring uh, task. So maybe you uh, run a nightly cleanup job and you want to clean up some cloud resources. So uh, in this activity, you would then clean up some cloud resources, but maybe not everything gets cleaned up in one go. So you can then um, create a timer in your workflow and say, okay, I want to run this now, but maybe start again in 15 minutes. So the workflow will then wait 15 minutes, and then you can instruct the workflow to continue as a new instance. So this is something different than like a workflow replay, which is really like an internal thing, but you can explicitly say to the workflow, I want you to create a new instance of yourself um, and, and continue again. The final method uh, and the final pattern actually is called external system interaction. That is a really powerful one because you can actually instruct the workflow to wait until it has received an, ex an event that comes from another system. Uh, and that's usually uh, very useful when you do some kind of an approval flow. So in this case, uh, maybe you want to buy a laptop and uh, that's exceeding your budget, so you need some kind of manager approval. So in this first get approval step, uh, a uh, message to your manager is sent. Um, and they use a UI, they click a button of approve or, or don't approve. Um, that event is being sent back to the workflow. Uh, and based on the payload of that, of that event, you can choose like a different path in your workflow if it's approved or not approved. So this is like an example of uh, more of a real life um, uh, workflow example, because you usually you don't use like one pattern, you combine several patterns. So this pattern combines like uh, task chaining, but also fan out, fan in, and waiting for an event. And the, uh, the nice thing about Dapper workflow is uh, when you use Dapper, you have this whole suite of different building blocks. Uh, so in all of these activities, you can use these other Dapper APIs as well. Okay, then small bit of information about the, the Debra workflow engine. So how do, you, how do you, first, how do you write these things? Well, we're gonna see some code demo later, but um, you have your own .NET application uh, with your workflow definition and all of your activity definitions, uh, because you as a developer, you're responsible for writing this workflow definition. Um, uh, but the Debra sidecar, uh, that contains the workflow engine. So what, what, what happens when your application is up and the Debra sidecar is up, uh, then a connection will be established between the workflow app and your uh, and the Debra workflow engine. That's the gRPC stream. And as soon as the Debra sidecar uh, receives an instruction to schedule a workflow, you can either do it via an, an SDK or, or via this REST call that you see here. Uh, whenever, whenever this happens, uh, the Debra runtime will communicate with your workflow app to schedule a workflow, and then the workflow runs in your own application, but it will continuously communicate with the Debra sidecar uh, to uh, make sure that all of the state is checkpointed into the database. Okay, it's time for a demo now. Um, it's a bit of a sort of a simplistic order workflow thing. So we have like a workflow application that contains several activities. It communicates with an inventory, so it, it communicates with the key value store, um, and it communi communicates with a shipping um, a service. Uh, two different endpoints are used there, one to calculate the shipping cost, and finally to register uh, the, sh the shipment. All right, uh, let me go to the right folder. Uh, we can get rid of this. Uh, no. Okay, workflow demo. 
Right, before I run it, I will quickly go to some, uh, to some source code. So what we have here is, again, a web application using .NET 8. Uh, my dependency is a bit different now. I now have a package called dapper.workflow, uh, because we, want, we are using some base types when we actually are writing the workflow. And we have a look at our uh, program CS file here. Oh. Um, we see quite some similar setup as before. One thing that is new is the um, addition of the workflow client. So we need uh, the workflow client to actually start a workflow or to pause a workflow or to stop a workflow. And what is very important, we need to register the workflow and all of the activities using the add Debra workflow method. Because if you don't do this, a Debra sidecar has no knowledge about, about the workflows that are in our application. So this validate order endpoint is what I'm going to call with a REST client. Uh, we're going to provide it an order payload, and then we will inject the Debra workflow client. And then we're going to use this workflow client uh, here, and we're going to use the schedule new workflow async. And it's very important to know that everything you do with workflows is always asynchronous communication. Um, so uh, what happens is the workflow will be scheduled, but we don't know exactly when it will be started or when it will be finished, because in theory, th th this workflow could take hours or, or days or months. Uh, so and what we get back is an instance ID of the workflow, and we, could, we can use that instance ID to get information back about the status. So let's have a look at the workflow itself. Uh, so the workflow is it's just a regular .NET class, uh, but we inherit from a base type that we get from the dapper.workflow package. So we inherit from workflow, we specify what the input type is and what the output type is of this workflow, and we need to override the, the, the run async method here. And the run async method gives us a uh, workflow context, and we can use this context to interact with the, with, with the workflow, to schedule all kinds of calls, to create timers, uh, etc. So we see here that uh, I'm using the context to uh, create, uh, to, to call an activity. You have to provide it the output type, so what do we expect back of this activity? Well, this activity is called update inventory, and what will be done here is uh, we will reduce the inventory with the quantity of our order. We get back an inventory result. Then we um, uh, ask, uh, and then we check, for, okay, is there sufficient stock? Because if there's not, I can't even complete uh, with the rest. Um, then if there's sufficient stock, um, I want to check which shipping service is the cheapest to use. So I've got a hard-coded list here of three shipping services. Ideally, of course, this should also come out of an activity call. Um, and what's happening here is I'm iterating over these shipping services. And for each of these shipping services, I am making an activity call again to get shipping cost. So this is another activity that I'm calling. Um, but as you notice here, I'm not awaiting this call. So, I so the result of this method is task of type shipping cost result. But I'm adding all these tasks to this list that I've defined here. List of task shipping cost result. So at the end of this for each, I have a, a list of three tasks. Uh, and this is now where the part where the fan out fan in happens. So here, where I do await task when all, there I provide the list of tasks. So that's when uh, the Debra runtime takes over and schedules all these activities, and then waits uh, until everything uh, is, uh, is completed. When it is completed, I uh, ask, uh, I, I do a like query for going give me the one which has like uh, the lowest cost, uh, and then I know which shipping service to use. And finally, I am calling another uh, activity called register shipment, so I'm using uh, the, the cheapest one, and there I want to register my shipment for this order. Now notice I'm, I'm uh, using a try-catcher, I haven't used it um, uh, in the other ones, but using a try-catch when making activity calls is another way of dealing with failure. Uh, so for instance, what happens if this register shipment, if it fails, uh, and I keep retrying and retrying, but it doesn't recover, right? That, that's a very, that can happen. Um, what happens then is, um, um, in case this results in an uh, exception, um, and the exception gets wrapped in a workflow task failed exception, so that's what I'm catching here. Uh, and in this catch, I can then introduce like a new path. Uh, so this is like an alternative path, so if one activity fails, well then I can maybe do something else. Uh, and typically this is known as like, an, uh, like a compensation action that you can do. And the compensation action I'm doing in this case is I'm actually undoing the update inventory that, that I'd done earlier. And so earlier I am um, um, subtracting um, my order quantity from the inventory, and now I'm just adding my order uh, quantity back to the inventory uh, as if nothing happened. So this is also like a, a powerful technique to add these compensation actions. Okay, uh, I'm not going to show you all of these individual activities, but we, because we are running out of time, um, what I will do is now I'm going to uh, run this workflow, 
Again, I'm using a, a Debra Multi App Run because I'm running two apps, workflow app and my shipping app. I'm going to run everything. I will start um, the call uh, to actually run the workflow and it will, it, it will start, uh, but then I will stop halfway through. So I will stop the entire process and we can see what's, uh, what, what's happening then. Uh, well, yeah, here I am. Oh, I first actually need to uh, make sure I have enough inventory because I'm using an in-memory state store. So each time I, I, I start, I have to make sure I have like enough uh, enough state. So I have like a product quantity of, uh, of uh, five of a product type uh, uh, Rubber Duck 1000, perfect. So this is the validate order. So this actually initiates my, um, uh, my workflow. So I'm ordering two uh, Rubber Duckies. Okay, so I'm gonna do send request now. That starts the workflow, but now I'm stopping the whole process. So as you can see, the last thing that happened is uh, the app workflow, uh, it, it reduced the inventory, so that happened, and then it called out to the shipping app. And uh, had the request arrived there, and we are getting the shipping cost uh, for this order. But then I shut down everything, so the shipping app could not communicate back to the workflow app because everything is now down. Okay, pretty, pretty bad. Uh, but what happens if I now just restart uh, the whole thing? So I'm restarting the entire workflow process. Yeah, time's up, I know. <laughs> All right, and now we see it makes the same request again, so it's getting, it's getting the cost, uh, but it's also continuing. And now we see actually, yeah, so it, it's gotten the result, here it's getting the result, here it's getting all of the, uh, all of the cost. Uh, and we see that, uh, here we see that the workflow state is actually completed. Right, so ha having like a workflow engine such as Dapper Workflow yeah, really helps in, in creating more resilient uh, applications. That's really, really awesome. Okay, um, just to close off, almost there. Uh, let me quickly drop this. All right, so yeah, I've shown you like two different ways how Dapper can help you like build resilient applications, resiliency policies that are built in, uh, and Dapper Workflow, really powerful. Um, if you want to try this yourself, uh, feel free to, to get your camera and scan these QR codes. So the left one points to the GitHub repo where are all of the source code lives and all of the slides and all of the links. So please have a look there. Uh, if you have, want to up your game and improve your production readiness for your Dapper applications, uh, feel free to uh, try out Diagrid Conductor. So that's this one. Um, and uh, last but not least, since you've been uh, patiently uh, hearing me ramble about Dapper, you're, you definitely can claim this Dapper community uh, supporter badge. Uh, it's not an NFT. Uh, if you claim this one via the, uh, via the link here, you need to sign in with your GitHub profile and then you can claim this badge and you can, uh, you can, you can share it either online, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn. I would be lovely to, to see that. I'll, I'll give you a like. And thanks everyone for your attention.